we are going to begin looking at the cardiovascular system and we're going to begin doing that by taking a look at blood. Blood is our only fluid tissue. If you remember back to when we covered histology, it is a form of connective tissue. And there are several components that make it up. So we have some what we call formed elements. Those are going to be the cells, the different types of cells in our blood. And then we have plasma. So you can see um, over here, the formed elements. We have erythrocytes or red blood cells, leukocytes or white blood cells, and thrombocytes, which are platelets. The remainder of blood is plasma, and that is the liquid part of blood. We'll take a look at that in just a minute, and then we'll get into um, the different formed elements from there. So if we just first look at some physical characteristics of blood, um, our blood is red. Uh, there's a common misconception that we do have blood that is blue, and we actually do not. Um, the color is gonna change from either bright red to like a dark red, and what changes the color is the amount of oxygen that our blood has in it at whatever point in time. So if we have um, blood that is carrying a lot of oxygen, it's gonna have a bright red color. And if it is oxygen poor because it's been, the oxygen has been delivered to all the cells of your body, it's gonna be a dark red. The uh, pH has to stay within a very narrow range. So it needs to be between 7.35 and 7.45. Um, it needs to be in that range for um, the different kinds of reactions to happen that we need uh, in our blood. Uh, we need it for the metabolism that happens as well. Um, and we have different parts of our blood that will help to maintain its pH and we'll cover those in a little bit. Blood temperature is a little higher than a body temperature. Our normal body temperature is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, but for blood, um, it's about 100.4 degrees. Fahrenheit, and that is going to help maintain our overall body temperature. If we take a look here at the different components of blood, we have the formed elements on the left and plasma on the right. Um, our red blood cells, or again, our erythrocytes, are going to be responsible for uh, carrying oxygen around our body. White blood cells are going to help fight infection, and you can see that there are several types of white blood cells there. Um, we'll go through them a little later in the lesson, and then um, even though we're just starting the immune system, or sorry, we're just starting cardiovascular system today, our next system will be the immune system, and we'll get into the specifics of um, our white blood cells then. So in, in general, um, they're just going to help to fight infection, and then our platelets are going to help um, with a process called hemostasis or uh, help to stop bleeding. All of them you can see are made in our red bone marrow. As for plasma, um, it's about 90% water, so most of it is water. Uh, we do absorb the water to uh, help maintain our blood volume in the plasma uh, from our intestines. There are proteins. Um, we're gonna talk about all of these, so I won't go into them too much on this slide. Um, there's different salts, gases that are gonna be in the plasma, which would be oxygen and carbon dioxide. Uh, nutrients from absorbing from our intestines so that that can be carried around to all of the cells of our body. Um, waste will be um, in your plasma as well and that'll be filtered out by your kidneys. Um, and then there will also be hormones and vitamins that will um, be carried in your plasma as well. So again, some of these we're going to go through in more specifics. So we'll start with looking at plasma. Again, that's the liquid part of our blood. Uh, you can see here it's like a yellowish color. Uh, we call that a straw color. Plasma is about 90% water. Um, it's got various dissolved substances in it. So like we just mentioned in the previous slide, uh, nutrients, salts, which are our electrolytes. So if you've ever had like Gatorade or Powerade, um, those electrolytes that you're replacing are to help replace any um, of those salts in your plasma that you may have. Uh, sweated out during exercise or like playing a sport. Uh, you also have respiratory gases, hormones, plasma proteins, and wastes that are going to be carried by your plasma. And this part of your blood makes up about 55% of your total blood volume. So here we can see if you were to take a blood sample and put it into a test tube here that we can see, uh, and then put it into a machine called a centrifuge, which would spin it around and separate out the parts. Um, the bottom part it would be our red blood cells that should be around 45 percent 
Um, that percent is called the hematocrit or the measure of red blood cells in our blood. Um, plasma is about 55%. The reason why I'm saying about is because we have around 1% there that would be your white blood cells and your platelets. And that is called the Buffy coat. Uh, looking at the specific parts of water or of plasma, again, we have water. Um, it makes up, again, 90% of our plasma volume. And it's going to serve as a solvent for helping to carry other substances. So it's going to absorb or um, I'm reading too and trying to talk about something else at the same time. Um, sorry. The um, It's going to like help dissolve other substances, which is what a solvent does, so that they can be carried um, in the plasma. Um, the water part of plasma also helps to absorb heat, which is going to maintain that around 100.4 degrees uh, temperature that our blood is supposed to be at. Um, for our salts or electrolytes, that's going to include sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, chloride, and bicarbonate. Um, those are going to help regulate the osmotic balance of our plasma. That's going to help also with pH buffering. Um, so when I said before how the, um, the pH needs to be between 7.35 and 7.45, those salts will help to keep the pH in that narrow range. Um, the salts will also help to regulate how permeable um, the membranes of our cells are, meaning how easily something can move in and out of our cells. Next, we have plasma proteins. Uh, albumin is one, um, and it is going to help with osmotic balance as well as pH buffering. Um, so again, that will also help to maintain our uh, pH of our blood between that 7.35 and 7.45. Next, we have fibrinogen, and that helps with blood clotting, so that will assist our platelets. Uh, and then globulins, those are going to help with um, defense, so it'll be like antibodies, uh, but they also help to transport lipids. Other substances that are transported by our blood would include nutrients, so that would be glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, and vitamins. Uh, we'll have the waste products of metabolism, specifically it's going to be urea and uric acid, and those will be filtered out by our kidneys and then gotten rid of our body in our urine. Respiratory gases, so that would be oxygen and carbon dioxide, and then hormones. Uh, steroid hormones and thyroid hormone are going to be carried around in our uh, blood by our plasma proteins. Our first formed element we're going to look at would be erythrocytes or red blood cells, and we're going to start with those because they are the most abundant formed element. Um, as we went over before, they should make up about 45% of our total blood volume. So the common name for an erythrocyte would be a red blood cell, or we abbreviate that as RBC. Their job is to carry oxygen to all the cells of our body. And to be able to do that, they have a protein in them called hemoglobin. Uh, we abbreviate that as HB. Uh, hemoglobin has iron in it. Um, so part of the reason why you need a certain amount of iron in your diet is so that your red blood cells can carry oxygen efficiently. The shape you can see here, um, it's a circle, but they're kind of dented in on each side. We call that a biconcave disc. Um, and the reason why they have that shape is to allow them some flexibility because when they go through our smallest blood vessels, which are capillaries, they're gonna need to sometimes fold in half um, to be able to fit through. So, um, and they go through single file. So by having that shape and that flexibility, that's going to allow them to um, fit through our small blood vessels. Um, in, and we're going to see this measurement a lot throughout us talking about blood. Um, cubic millimeter of blood, that is roughly a drop of blood. So that means that in one drop of blood, we should have about 5 million red blood cells. And that's just kind of an average, but um, around four or five. 5 million red blood cells in one single drop of blood. Um, some We're also going to be looking at just different homeostatic imbalances as we go through and talk about blood. So one common one is anemia. You may have heard of that before. What that means is that your blood um, has a decreased uh, ability to carry oxygen. And there's different kinds of anemia and different things that can cause that. So... Um, a decrease in red blood cell number would um, cause these first four types of anemia here. So hemorrhagic anemia would come from a sudden hemorrhage, um, a sudden loss of blood. So if you um, 
lose blood, you're not gonna have as many red blood cells as you should. So your blood's not gonna be able to carry as much oxygen as it's supposed to. And that would in turn make you anemic. Next, we have hemolytic anemia. Um, some There are some bacterial infections that cause our red blood cells to lyse or to burst. Um, again, that's gonna decrease our red blood cell number and then decrease the oxygen of carrying ability of our blood. Um, we do need vitamin B12 that's absorbed um, in our digestive system because if we don't have enough vitamin B12, that can ca cause something called pernicious anemia. Um, your red blood cells don't mature like they're supposed to. Uh, next, we have aplastic anemia, and um, this comes when there is an issue with the bone marrow because the red bone marrow is going to be what makes our red blood cells. Um, and that could be due to cancer, radiation, certain medications might um, like depress the function of your bone marrow or even destroy your bone marrow. So all of those four are going to cause anemia because of a decrease in red blood cell number. Next, we have iron deficiency anemia. Um, this is going to be when there's in, like not enough hemoglobin content in our red blood cells. Um, this could either be from just a poor amount of iron being consumed in the diet. You're not getting enough iron. Um, so your, your hemoglobin doesn't have enough and you don't carry enough oxygen. Uh, or it can be from prolonged bleeding. So one example would be like maybe somebody has a bleeding ulcer in their stomach and they're unaware of it and they're you know kind of losing some blood that way. Um, this could also happen like with for a female with heavy menstrual periods. Um, and then next we have um, a form of anemia that is genetic um, and that is sickle cell anemia. The hemoglobin in a person's red blood cells who has sickle cell anemia is abnormal. Um, so it causes the red blood cells, instead of having this shape, they become sharp and sickle shaped or kind of crescent shaped under low oxygen conditions. So for example, if um, they were playing a sport or exercising and they didn't get enough oxygen in their body, then that could um, kind of trigger that change in shape in those cells. Um, and they would go into what's called sickle cell crisis. Um, they would need to get a medication to reverse that. Um, if not, it is something that can cause major problems for a person with sickle cell anemia. Uh, another issue with red blood cells is something called thalassemia. Um, this is a genetic condition, so it would be inherited from both parents. Um, and it causes a person to have low red blood cell counts and because of that, not enough hemoglobin. Um, some symptoms of thalassemia would include slow growth. Um, they might have brittle bones. Their spleen it would become enlarged. Um, they're very fatigued, they're pallor. They don't have like a good color to their skin. That's what that means. Um, these symptoms would usually show up by age two. There are treatments for thalassemia that would include blood transfusions because that's going to replace um, the red blood cells that they're not making naturally uh, or stem cell transplants so that that would allow them to make their own red blood cells. Um, there are common groups from around the world where, um, what I mean by common is that uh, these genes are kind of more prevalent in the gene pools. Um, and that would include Italians, Greeks, Middle Easterners, South, South Asians, and Africans. Um, so it seems like the genes that would cause thalassemia tend to be more common uh, in people from those areas. Next, we have polycythemia, and this is kind of the opposite, is when you have too many red blood cells. Um, it can be caused by bone marrow cancer, which is called polycythemia vera, and there are multiple kinds of bone marrow cancer. Leukemia is a bone marrow cancer, um, but the form of cancer called polycythemia vera um, causes the red blood cells to be overproduced. Um, living at a high altitude um, can cause what we call secondary polycythemia, um, because at a higher altitude, there's less available oxygen for a person to use. Um, that would cause them to make more red blood cells to make up for the less like, amount of oxygen in the air that is available to them. Um, the issue with having too many red blood cells is that it's going to increase the thickness or the viscosity of the blood, um, and that's going to impair circulation. So your heart's going to have to pump harder, um, and you can be more prone to blood clots because you have too many red blood cells. While we're still talking about red blood cells, we'll talk about hematocrit here. 
Um, I did mention this earlier, but uh, if you had a blood sample taken and that were put into a test tube, that was put into a centrifuge to spin around and separate out the parts of your blood. Um, the hematocrit would be the measurement of your percent of your blood volume that's made up of your erythrocytes. Around 45% is normal, okay? Um, so erythrocyte is just that measurement, just that measurement of um, your red blood cells. But while we're looking at those other values, um, that 55% around there should be your plasma, and that less than 1% is what we call the buffy coat, and that includes your white blood cells and your platelets. So next we'll move on to look at the formed elements, which would be our next formed element, which would be uh, leukocytes or our white blood cells or WBCs. Um, overall, they function to defend against disease. Per cubic millimeter of blood or per drop of blood, um, we should have between 4,800 and 10,800 white blood cells in a single drop of blood. Um, they do have some unique characteristics. So one of those is called diapodesis, which um, actually allows your white blood cells to move out of the bloodstream and out through the blood vessels into the surrounding tissues. Um, really, they just use the circulatory system and are part of blood for transport around the body. They kind of like hitch a ride through our blood um, in order to get to where they might need to fight an infection. Um, they're actually able to locate areas of damaged tissue or infection. Um, so one example would be like if a virus is infect infecting our cells, um, viruses kind of hijack our cells and turn them into little virus factories. And then the viruses rupture out of our cells. Um, when a cell ruptures, that's going to release chemicals. Um, and that will attract white blood cells to that area because um, they're damaged and release those chemicals. That's called positive chemotaxis. Um, and then the way that they're able to move through spaces, spaces in our tissues is called amoeboid motion. Um, so because they can move that way, they can kind of like squirm their way through the cells of our tissues to get where they need to go. Again, to find um, and hopefully defeat whatever infection might be invading our bodies. Um, with leukocytes, or again, white blood cells, um, if somebody has a blood test done and they have an elevated white blood cell count, um, such as over 11,000 in one drop of blood, that's called leukocytosis. And that's usually just a sign of an infection. It could be a bacterial infection or a viral infection. Uh, leukopenia is a very low white blood cell count. Um, there can be certain drugs that would cause that. One example would be um, somebody who is receiving chemotherapy. They're usually going to have a low white blood cell count, um, which makes them more prone to other infections. Next, uh, leukemia. I mentioned that earlier. That is another form of um, bone marrow cancer. Um, we mentioned polycythemia there earlier. Um, but with leukemia, hopefully that prefix leuco for uh, leukocytes and leukemia kind of make in your mind, make them go together. Um, so what happens is that your bone marrow becomes cancerous. Huge, huge numbers of white blood cells are produced. So um, a person would have a very high white blood cell count. Normally, you would think like, why is that a problem? Um, because I have extra cells to protect me with my immune system then. But the issue with this is that the white blood cells aren't given time to mature because they're produced too quickly. So they actually, even though you have a lot of them, they actually are not able to fight off infection. Um, we classify white blood cells into two major groups. They are either granulocytes or agranulocytes. So you can see them here. Uh, we've got neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils that are granulocytes. And monocytes and lymphocytes are agranulocytes. Literally the only thing that puts them into one category or the other is whether they have these little granules or little dots that we see in these drawings um, in their cytoplasm or they don't have, have them. Um, when you have the prefix A in front of something, it just means they lack that or do not have that. So monocytes and lymphocytes do not have those granules in their cytoplasm. Uh, we're going to go through and talk about briefly what each of them do. Um, so neutrophils are basically active phagocytes. So they're going to be moving around um, and kind of basically eating things that shouldn't be there, kind of getting rid of, absorbing, and destroying um, 
like a virus or bacteria, for example. Um, if there is a short-term infection, the number of neutrophils will increase pretty quickly. Normally, um, you have between 3,000 and 7,000 neutrophils in one drop of blood. So that makes up roughly 40 to 70% of your white blood cells. Next, we have eosinophils. Um, those are going to, it seems very specific, but um, they are responsible for attacking any parasitic worms that might invade our body. Um, and they would do that with digestive enzymes that they contain inside of them. They also have a very complex role in allergies. Um, so I know there are commercials for different like asthma treatments and um, one of them mentions eosinophilic asthma, and that is in response to the eosinophils responding and causing that um, uh, asthmatic response. In a drop of blood, we would have between 100 and 400 eosinophils, which that makes up about 1 to 4% of our white blood cells. Next, we have basophils. Um, what they're going to do is release a chemical called a histamine. And that is a vasodilator, so it's going to dilate your um, blood vessels at sites of inflammation. Um, so maybe where there's like an injury. Uh, they do contain heparin, which is an anticoagulant, so it will prevent blood clotting. Um, in a drop of blood, we have between 20 and 50 basophils, which is between 0 to 1% of our total white blood cells. Lymphocytes, uh, we'll talk about them a lot when we do the immune system. Um, they are basically part of the immune system. We have B cells and T cells. Um, B cells are going to kind of be like little antibody factories. Um, and then T cells are, there's lots of kinds of T cells. So we've got like killer T cells that'll destroy infected cells. Um, helper T cells that help to identify infection. Uh, suppressor T cells that will slow down the immune response once the infection's been fought off. Um, in one drop of blood, we have between 1,500 and 3,000 lymphocytes. Uh, so that's roughly between 20 and 45% of our white blood cells. And then next we have monocytes. Um, those are phagocytes as well. Phagocytes are basically eating cells. Um, they're going to become macrophages in our tissues. And we'll touch on that more um, when we do the immune system specifically. Um, but it's basically going to be like the cleanup crew kind of. Um, and you might see a higher number of monocytes in a chronic infection or like a long-term infection. Normally we have between 100 and 700 monocytes in a single drop of blood. So that would be between four and 8% of our white blood cells. In order to remember, um, the abundance of our white blood cells in order from the most to the least, um, in that order, it would be neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. If we take the first letter from each one, and if you can remember the saying, never let monkeys eat bananas, okay, that's for neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils in that order, okay, from most to least amount. Um, again, we're going to go through them in a lot more detail, our white blood cells, um, when we cover the immune system. So our last formed element would be our thrombocytes or our platelets. Um, they are basically cell fragments. And in this picture, you can see all these little arrows that are pointing to these tiny, tiny little dots. Um, those are our platelets. So the arrows in this picture are really bigger than the, the platelets are. Um, all of these kind of circles that we have, those are um, our red blood cells or our erythrocytes. Uh, right here, this like larger cell that is stained purple, that would be one of our white blood cells. Okay, so platelets are these little tiny cell fragments. Um, they come from cells called megakaryocytes that pinch off little pieces of themselves to become platelets. Their function is going to be to help to uh, clot blood. And um, in one drop of blood, we have between 150,000 and 400,000 platelets. For um, our cells to be formed, so for us to actually get red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, um, they're going to come from um, a stem cell in our red bone marrow called a hemocytoblast. Um, and then that's going to divide, so we would have a hemocytoblast here. Um, it's going to become either a lymphoid stem cell or a myeloid stem cell. Um, the lymphoid stem cell would become our lymphocytes. Um, 
and then or our leukocytes um and then uh, our white blood cells um part of them anyway sorry um and then our myeloid stem cells are going to become our other essentially um all of our other formed elements once um the hemocytoblast is committed to either becoming a myeloid stem cell or a lymphoid stem cell it can't change from there um, and then once a myeloid stem cell starts to become a red blood cell, it can't switch to a platelet and vice versa, uh, or a white blood cell, vice versa. For our red blood cells, they only live about, um, like three months. So three to four months. So their average lifespan is between like hundred and 120 days. Um, when they are worn out, they're broken down by our spleen and our liver. Um, so they constantly have to be replaced because they only live like three to four months. Um, our red blood cells, as they're developing, they're going to produce so uh, like a, a ton of hemoglobin so that they can carry, uh, oxygen adequately. Um, when the hemocytoblast is going from a hemocytoblast or from that stem cell to a mature red blood cell, that process takes about three to five days. Um, to control red blood cell production, our kidneys actually produce a hormone called erythropoietin. Um, and that's going to signal our bone marrow. So the target tissue for erythropoietin would be our bone marrow. Um, and that gets it to produce red blood cells. Um, erythropoietin is going to be released by the kidneys in response to um, low oxygen levels in the body. So it could be low oxygen levels because um, you're having like breathing difficulty maybe, um, or it could be low oxygen, like your blood cells are just being worn out and it's time to replace them. Okay. Um, for white blood cells and platelets, those are stimulated by other hormones. Um, your white blood cells, we're going to have colony stimulating factors and interleukins that get our red bone marrow to specifically produce white blood cells. Um, and then platelets, if you remember, they're called thrombocytes. So a hormone called thrombopoietin will get um, platelets to be produced from megakaryocytes. When bleeding happens, um, we need that obviously, hopefully obviously to stop. Um, so that stoppage of bleeding is called hemostasis. Um, so you need to have a clot form in order to stop that blood flow from where there is bleeding. Um, so that blood clotting process normally takes between three and six minutes. The first thing that's going to happen would be vascular spasm. So in the walls of our blood vessels, um, there is muscle. So there's going to be smooth muscle contractions. Um, and that helps to constrict the blood vessel where the tear would be. Um, and that, all, that will help to contribute to um, stopping the loss of blood. The next thing that happens would be that we were going to have a platelet plug that forms. Um, so where you have that injury in the blood vessel wall, um, that's going to expose collagen fibers and they'll kind of act like a web to trap platelets. Um, the platelets are then going to release chemicals that cause the platelets themselves to become sticky. Um, and that forms a plug there in the wall. Um, what happens next is coagulation. So you have clotting. Um, there are clotting factors in the plasma. Um, and there's also factors that are going to be released by the um, injured tissue in the, the blood vessel wall. Um, they're going to interact with calcium in the blood to form an enzyme called thrombin. Um, what happens then is that fibrinogen in the plasma, which we mentioned that before, um, are going to join to form what we call fibrin. Fibrin is going to form a mesh and that mesh is going to help to trap platelets as well as red blood cells. And that's going to be what forms the clot and essentially stops the bleeding process. Um, if you've ever heard that if you have a cut, you should put pressure on it. Um, it gets the bleeding to stop faster. What actually happens and the, the reason it's kind of crazy, but the reason why that actually works is that when you're putting pressure on it, it's actually, kind of causing more damage um, at that site because it's you're putting pressure on um, those cells and you're fracturing more cells. That's going to cause the release of tissue factor to increase. Um, and then that gets clotting to happen faster. So by putting pressure on a bleeding wound, you are actually increasing the damage, but it's helping stop that bleeding more quickly. 
Um, sometimes there is clotting that happens when we don't want it to happen. Um, one of those is called a thrombus. Um, a thrombus is basically a clot, but it happens in a blood vessel that was not broken. Um, if that clot is actually large enough, it can block blood flow. Next is an emb uh, embolus, or you might have heard of an embolism. Um, when a thrombus, like a piece of that clot, breaks away uh, from the wall of the vessel that it's in and it flows through the bloodstream, um, it gets carried somewhere else in the body. And that can become very problematic if it's a narrow blood vessel. Um, sometimes, like if it goes to a vessel in your lungs, that could cause a pulmonary embolism. If it's in a blood vessel carrying blood to your brain, that can cause a stroke. Um, if sometimes people have um, conditions where they are more prone to forming, uh, prone to forming blood clots or prone to forming a thrombus, um, so they're put on medications which are called anticoagulants that could include um, something like aspirin or heparin. Um, and those are blood thinners that help to prevent them from forming a blood clot. The opposite of that would be a bleeding disorder. So you don't have a way to adequately stop bleeding when that happens. Um, so first here we have thrombocytopenia, um, and that's just where a person doesn't have enough platelets. And actually normal movements, um, maybe like barely bumping into something as well, can cause um, just your small blood vessels to bleed. They're going to have purplish, block, purplish blotches on their skin called petechia. Um, and any kind of uh, condition that suppresses the bone marrow, it could be cancer, um, certain medications or getting radiation treatments, those can all cause thrombocytopenia. Uh, next, we have hemophilia. Um, that is hereditary. Uh, it's actually a sex-linked trait, if you remember doing that kind of Punnett square in bio. Um, so there are factors needed for clotting. Um, and basically, with hemophilia, you lack any of those factors that you would need. Um, so just minor injuries can cause prolonged bleeding. So where, you know, maybe like a paper cut that bleeds, you stop bleeding in a, in, you know, a few seconds to a minute or so. Um, they would, a person with hemophilia would lose a lot more blood than a person without hemophilia. Um, treatments for either of these would include blood transfusions because that will get them more platelets um, that they would be able to use and more clotting factor in the plasma. Next, we've got blood types. Um, there are four major blood groups and we'll go through what they are. Um, your red blood cells have antigens on their surface to identify basically what kind of blood a person has. Um, an antigen is kind of like an ID tag on the surface of a cell. Um, and then in the plasma, there are antibodies that circulate um, to protect a person against foreign invaders, um, even in this case if it's just a different kind of red blood cell. If and when the antibodies detect an antigen that's not supposed to be in the body, they're going to bind to those foreign cells to clump together, and that process is called agglutination. Um, so that clumping of cells would occur in that case. If we take a look at the blood groups, so we call them ABO blood groups. Um, there's blood group AB, B, A, and O. Um, the antigens on the surface of the red blood cell identify what kind of blood that person has. So a person with type AB blood has A and B antigens on the surface of their red blood cells. Um, in person with type B blood would have B antigens, A blood would have A antigens. Type O blood has no antigens. So really, if you think of it like zero, there's zero antigens for a blood type on the surface of those cells. Um, and then the antibodies are going to be against the other blood types. Um, so there are no antibodies in the plasma against other blood types if the person has AB blood. Um, because if they had anti-A or anti-B antibodies, it would attack their own blood. Um, type B blood with B antigens has anti-A antibodies. So that would attack A blood if they were given it or AB blood if they were given it. Um, Type A blood with A antigens has anti-B antibodies. Type O blood is going to have anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Now, people that can receive that blood, type AB blood can actually get blood from all four groups. So they're called the universal recipient. 
And the reason why they can get all four is because they don't have any of those antibodies in their plasma that would attack any of those other blood types. Um, for type B blood, they can receive blood from people with type B or from type O. Um, type A blood can receive from A or from O. And then type O blood can only receive from O. So we call them the universal donor. Um, and that the reason why they're the universal donor is that they don't have those antibodies to kind of, tr or sorry, they don't have those antigens to trigger any of the antibodies in another blood type. Uh, also with blood types, we have RH groups. Um, RH is another antigen that can be present on red blood cells. If it is present, we call them RH positive. If it is not present or if it's absent, we call them RH negative. Um, so a person could have an A antigen and an RH antigen. We would, in that case, call them A positive. Um, if they have A antigens but no RH antigens, we would call them A negative. So that's just how the positive negative part of a blood type works. Um, so here's just some kind of pictures to let you see how this would work. So, um, we have A negative blood. Um, so these little triangles are representing A antigens. Here would be A positive blood. So these little uh, like rectangles are representing RH um, antigens. So an um, A negative person, right here you can see that they have um, anti-B antibodies and anti-RH antibodies. Somebody with A positive blood is only going to have anti-B antibodies. Over here, we have B negative blood, so they're going to have anti-A antibodies and anti-RH antibodies. B positive blood is only going to have anti-A antibodies. And the reason you can tell, for example, that this would be an anti-A antibody is because that end fits kind of like a puzzle piece onto the A antigen. Um, and then here we would have the RH antibody, that little kind of squarish rectangular shape that would fit onto um, the RH anti antigens. Sorry. Um, so a reason why, for example, you could not give, uh, we'll just look at a, ne a, a negative blood. Somebody with A negative blood would have to uh, or not be able to get A positive blood. The A part would work okay, but if um, they were given A positive blood, they have this antibody and that's going to wind up attaching onto the RH antigens um, and causing that agglutination process or that blood clot to happen. We are going to do um, something with this later on with blood transfusion, so we'll go through this a little bit more um, at a later time. But here we can also see um, AB negative blood is only going to have RH antibodies. Um, AB positive blood will have no antibodies. O negative um, is going to have antibodies against all three, so against A, B, and RH. Um, o positive would just have the A and the B antibodies. So uh, with blood tests, if you ever have had a blood draw before, if you ever had to have blood taken, um, there are certain things that will be looked at in a blood sample that can give a doctor a lot of information. Um, so for white blood cells, the normal range should be between 4,500 and 10,000 in a drop of blood. Um, if the number of white blood cells is low, that shows that the person is at risk for an infection. If it's high, it could be a sign of infection or inflammation in their body. Uh, red blood cells, normal range is between 4.9 4 and 5.9 million in a drop of blood for males, and for females, between 4.1 and 5.1 million. Uh, low red blood cell count can be a sign of anemia or possible internal bleeding. Uh, if it's high, that can show that they have possibly polycythemia or are at risk for blood clots. Um, hemoglobin, a normal range for males, is between 14 and 17.5. And for females, it's between 12.3 and 15.3. Uh, hematocrit is usually between 41.5 to 50.4% for males. And for females, 36.9 to 44.6%. Um, remember, hematocrit was the percentage of red blood cells in the body. 
Uh, next we have mean corpuscular volume or MCV, and that just looks at the average size of your right, uh, red blood cells. So that normal score for the MCV value should be between 80 and 96. Um, if the blood cells are large, um, that shows low vitamin B12 or low folate levels. Um, that would be a higher score for your MCV. Um, small red blood cells can uh, indicate a type of anemia, and that would be signified by a lower MCV score. Um, for platelets, that normal range is, again, between 150,000 and 450,000 per cubic millimeter of blood or per drop of blood. Um, sometimes you would have a metabolic panel done or a comprehensive metabolic panel or CMP. Um, this blood draw is going to look at the function of the kidney and the liver, um, your glucose levels in your blood, electrolyte levels, and the protein levels in uh, your blood. So liver tests, um, something you would have done would be the alkaline phosphatase, that should be between 44 and 147. Uh, alanine amino transferase, that should be between 7 and 40. Uh, and then aspartase amino transferase should be between 10 and 34. Um, those are all substances mean, but made by the liver, so um, that will show having your numbers be in the normal ranges will show that your liver is functioning properly. Uh, and then another thing that we, they would look at for liver is something called bilirubin. Um, that's a waste product of your liver processing things, um, and that should be between 0.3 and 1.9. Again, having a normal value there shows your liver would be functioning properly. For uh, kidney tests, they would look at some waste products. Um, so your BUN or your blood urea nitrogen, that should be between 6 and 20. And your creatinine um, should be between 0.6 and 1.3. If those values are off, that can show that your kidneys are not functioning properly. For your electrolytes, we've got normal values here. Um, sodium should be between 136 and 145. Potassium between 3.5 and 5.1. Chloride between 96 and 106, and CO2 between 23 and 29. Um, those are going to show um, fluid balance, that your heart beats working properly, um, your muscles are contracting properly, you have proper brain control. Um, proteins, they would look at both albumin and your total protein. Albumin should be between 3.4 and 5. Total protein should be between 6 and 8.3. Um, if the values there for either of them are low, um, that could show either kidney problems, liver might not be working properly, or you're not getting proper nutrition. Uh, glucose should be between 70 and 99. Uh, if it is high, that can be a sign of diabetes. If it's low, uh, that can be something called hypoglycemia. Um, so when you have a blood test done, they should tell you if they're going to be checking your glucose that it should be a fasting um, blood test, and that is so that you don't, your food doesn't impact uh, your glucose reading. Uh, and then calcium should be between 8.6 and 10.2. Um, abnormal calcium values could show hormone problems, kidney, bone, or uh, pancreas problems. Uh, and then the final test we're going to talk about, and we will be doing um, next Monday, um, We'll be doing, wait, is it next Monday? I think so. Um, on the 22nd, whatever day that is, um, we're going to be doing a cholesterol uh, lab. Um, so we'll be looking at um, basically what would result from getting a lipid panel done. Um, we'll be looking at blood samples from five patients and testing the cholesterol levels and making treatment recommendations and then seeing if the treatments worked for our patients. Um, so when you have a lipid panel done, it's going to look at four types of lipids. It's going to give you your total cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and triglycerides. Um, so your total cholesterol normal is considered, it's considered normal, sorry, if you're under 200 for your total cholesterol. Um, borderline would be usually between 201 and 240. And then if it's above 240, it's considered high. Uh, LDL is low density lipoprotein that is considered our bad cholesterol. Um, so for LDL, it's low density, but if you think of L for lousy, that is your bad cholesterol. Having a lower LDL number is better uh, for your overall health. Um, so ideally, it's below 100. 
Um, if it's between 100 and 129, it's kind of considered okay. Um, between 130 and 159 is borderline, and then 160 to 189 is high. Um, above 190 is very high, and that can um, cause some issues that we'll look at when we get to that lab next week. Um, so LDL was lousy. HDL, think happy. That is your good cholesterol. Um, so having a higher HDL or high-density lipoprotein number is better. It's healthier for you. Um, so good is over 60. If it's between 40 and 59, it's kind of okay. And then below 40 is considered bad. Um, triglycerides should be below 150 to be normal. Okay. Um, having high total cholesterol, um, high LDL numbers, high triglycerides, and low HDL numbers, those, especially in combination like that, will increase the person's risk of heart disease. Okay, so again, with that lab we're going to do next week, um, we'll look more into um, these values and talk about what that means a little bit more. But that will be it for kind of our overview intro of blood. We do have several labs we're going to be doing um, to come back and kind of reference this information. Um, so yeah, we will continue on with blood in the next couple of weeks. <music>